The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, Coffee with Kalefi. Uh, this is Bob Hot Rod Roar, and I'm, uh, I'm coming from Reno, Nevada today. I'm out here at the Pepper Mill uh, Hotel. We're doing a little seminar out here this afternoon, so I'm up in a, in a room uh, presenting this. Hopefully my connection and everything stays on uh, through the uh, duration of this, but uh, welcome, everybody. Interesting at the Pepper Mill, tomorrow I'm going to take a, um, a tour of the mechanical building at the uh, Pepper Mill here in Reno, and they're getting 100% of their uh, heat and domestic hot water from a single geo well that they put in, I think, recently, within the last couple of years. It's a 4,400 foot deep well that supplies about 10,000 gallons per minute of 170 degree water and uh, big uh, plate heat exchangers that they send that through when they do all the, uh, so that'll be interesting. And maybe that'll be a good webinar. Maybe we can get some pictures tomorrow if they'll allow us and we can talk about that. And as I drive around with our rep here yesterday, there's a lot of small little geo applications around here where they're actually generating power as you drive down through the uh, down around the lake down to South Lake Tahoe you can see some of these little little geo uh, installations and one of the engineers that's going to be at my uh, seminar this afternoon has, has been involved in those he's retired now he acts as a consultant but so I'll have some pretty good uh, good feedback about that so anyways uh, today what we're going to talk about this is actually a part two as you recall, last month John Siegenthaler joined us and he did a part one of this about hydronic piping. And what I want to look at today and talk about is um, some of the um, the systems that are getting installed and some of the, uh, oh, I don't want to say mistakes necessarily, but some of the where the, the design is either off a little bit or the piping gets a little skewed between the, uh, you know, what's intended to happen and what ends up happening when the job is completed. So. A lot of the slides that we got today are actually from jobs that we've either visited or job photos that have been sent in to us or some of them I actually got a uh, hangout on heatinghelp.com, that little chat room that's online and pictures, I mean every day of the week somebody's posting pictures of a job that, you know, do it yourself or tried to put in or a contractor's trying to repair, hasn't worked properly. So we tried to get a collection of the, the most common ones that we see over and over and over again, which has been going on for my career in this industry, which is, you know, excess of 30 years now, and try and put some, you know, some, uh, I don't know, some logic or some numbers to that. So last month, Stephen Thaler, you know, explained those type of piping schematics that we use, like primary, secondary, and hydraulic separation, stuff like that. And today I'm going to try and put some pictures to, um, you know, jobs that were mispiped or misdesigned and, and you know, Help determine when it's time to you know pull out the sawzall and just start over, you know, start right from the boiler and just repipe it, or where you can make just a couple little piping corrections and get the system working the way it should be. So um, I think I've got four or five different typical jobs. So we're gonna we're gonna look at that and uh, you know questions. Just type them in as we go. I tried to keep it short today um, so we can leave room for the questions at the end so we don't run late. I know the last couple we ran a little bit late. And we appreciate that you stay in and. Uh, uh, stayed with us on those, but I want to try and keep it, you know, closer to the time. And I got to get to a seminar this afternoon too, so it's a little bit on my end also. So, anyways, um, hydronics. Hopefully, everybody that's listening in today is receiving these. We mail these out to you know twice a year for free. We put these issues together. Um, as always, we try and cover, you know, everything that's going on in our industry. We've covered a lot of different topics over the last uh, what. 19 issues, I guess, we're up to now. Uh, what I want to ask from everybody that's listening today, if there's a topic that you think we need to uh, to cover, that we need to cover again, that maybe we covered in the past but we want to update, or if you see something coming down the road that's going to be, uh, you know, a big deal in our in our industry, let us know and we'll, you know, if we don't have all the information, we'll go out and we'll find experts to help us put together, a, you know, both an hydronics issue and typically when we do an hydronics issue, uh, we like to do a coffee with Calafia or webinar around that issue, and that's kind of what we're doing today. If you got number 19, hopefully you got that. It has been mailed out. You notice that it was a fairly thick issue. There's a lot of pages in there. That's why we broke this up into two different uh, you know, segments where we wanted to cover as much as we could in there. So what's nice about coming to you live like this and talking about the pictures that are in there, because most of the slides I'll be showing you are coming right out of that Hydronics 19, it gives you the opportunity to interface with us and say, okay, you know, I saw that, uh, you know, that drawing that you had on page, you know, 24. Um, can I ask some questions about that? So it gives us a little bit of back and forth. But um, like I said, let us know what else we can help you with out there as far as uh, uh, future issues that we're going to be doing. We will have the next issue out at the ASHRAE show, which is hopefully everybody can uh, make it down to uh, Las Vegas this year for the ASHRAE show at the end of January. And that's where we'll have uh, issue number 20 will be out at that. 
These are available also on our website um, right there at the bottom. So if you need to you, you know, use a drawing out of there, you need a formula out of there, if you're out on a job site and you need help with a piping schematic or a wiring schematic out of one of the issues that we did on, uh, on relay boards or on the pumping, whatever, um, we make these so you can get you know, this information on your, uh, right on your phone or on your laptop or whatever you use to uh, take along with you. So um, that's where you can pull off the, the entire file or different pictures as you need them. So, um, all right, I think that's it on that. So what I want to look at is, um, like I say, some of the, the mistakes that we see being made out there and some of the fixes, but also, you know, what's changing in our industry as far as the high efficiency equipment that we're using, both with, you know, now we've got variable speed pumps that guys are using on the boiler side, sometimes they're using them on the distribution side, you know, how do those interfere with one another, how do they get along with one another, so a lot of the new equipment which comes out, you know, every couple months we see a new boiler, we see a new pump, or we see a new a different type of valve or something like that. They sometimes require different pumping uh, requirements, you know, different flow rates. You got to make sure that you can uh, maintain what the boilers require and what you need on your distribution side. So that sometimes involves a little bit different piping schematic than what we're used to. You know, you almost have to use either primary, secondary, or hydraulic separation now if you're going to have pumps that you know have different sizing requirements on the boiler side compared to the distribution side. So some of the things that we'll be showing, some of the piping that we're doing currently in our industry, we didn't have to do when we were doing just cast iron boilers that you could put a single pump on a cast iron boiler, very low pressure drop, you know, they didn't have a lot of problem with flow rate going through them. You could just put a single pump with zone valves or multiple pumps and away you go. It was that simple, but it's not that simple anymore as we go to higher efficiency equipment. You know, the size of the equipment's getting smaller, the fluid capacity of the, uh, some of the boilers does much smaller, so we've got to make sure that we're using the right components to get all the air out, to get all the dirt out, to get any magnetic particles out, and that they're piped in such a way that regardless of what's happening on the A and B side of the um, uh, you know, primary secondary loop or hydraulic separator, that um, you're getting the right amount of energy transferred. So that's what you'll see as we start going through these different uh, slides. So this is probably everywhere I go. This is I always start with this slide and with this concept here, the point of no pressure change. So the PONPC, and hopefully you've heard that term, you've heard that word. I know Dan Holohan's made a living about talking about pumping away for the last 40 years, pumping away, pumping away. And it's a concept I think probably Bell and Gossett I would credit for bringing this to our attention and why this is so important in systems and why it's changing a little bit now as we start doing systems with multiple pumps and you know hydraulic separators and stuff like that where we've got pumps in different locations. Where is the point of no pressure change now? Where do I put my pumps? Where does my expansion tank have to be in relationship to it? So what happened years ago when we were doing cast iron boilers, and this goes back you know, to the extent of my career, probably back into the 60s, the, the cast iron boilers used to come as what we call package boilers, and by that they would uh, send them right out to the job site in a crate, and they would have the pump mounted on the boiler, like you see in the picture here, and they, for some reason, they thought they needed to put the pumps on the return side, and there was different reasons that were, you know, presented for that. It made it easier to package the boiler in the crate. It made it so the pump would see the coldest water on the return side. There were different reasons, but so we could pump into the boiler. That wasn't an issue there, but we want to have our air removal, and we've talked about this in past webinars, we always want to have our air elimination device, our scoop, or ideally a, you know, a micro bubble separated like you see the disc out in this picture. We want to have that at the hottest point in the system, so immediately coming out of the boiler, coming right out here with the red line, that's the best place to get air removal. That's where air is going to be in its best uh, point to get it out of the system. And, Probably the best analogy I use when I explain why that should be there is, you know, when you put a pan on your stove and you put water in it and you turn the burner on, turn the gas on, and you'll see after a few seconds that little bubbles start forming the bottom of that pan and they rise up to the top and they come out of the solution. So that's what's going to happen every time the water in this boiler gets heated up, any little entrained air that's in that fluid is going to get driven out of solution and we want to catch it here before it gets out into our, you know, radiators and our radiant zones, whatever our distribution might be. So conveniently, when they make these different type of devices, whether you're using scoops or a, you know, a disc out like this here, they give you a convenience port on the bottom, and guys say, well, that's a perfect spot to hang my expansion tank. You know, it's threaded, it's the right size, it's a good location. Well, in this drawing here, you can see what's happening now. We're pumping at that point of no pressure change because I'm going to bounce back and forth here because maybe this will make it a little bit clearer. Let me explain what and how the point of no pressure change uh, works, and then we'll go back to that drawing. So. 
let's take a system and let's say we're just going to put a loop of pipe around a building and let's say it's you know 12 inches off the floor maybe we've got some heat emitters some fin tube we could have radiators panel radiators something in this loop distribution loop and now we're going to fill the system up and we're going to fill it to 10 pounds pressure so if I were to put a pressure gauge on every corner of this loop, let's say this is a 100-foot loop going around a, a room in a building, and I'm going to fill that up to a 10 pounds pressure. That's my static fill pressure. So every gauge on every corner of this loop going around this room is going to read 10 pounds pressure. They're all at the same level. Now, if I had to go around a doorway, and if I had to go up over a doorway and back down, and if I put a pressure gauge up here, that pressure gauge is going to read a couple pounds lower because it's up at a higher elevation. So... Let's just keep it simple. Let's keep it all at one level. All these gauges are run, running 10 pounds pressure. That's my static fill pressure. Now, no water can enter this system, and no water can get out of the system. It's a closed, sealed loop. There's not even a connection into it. So when I fill this up to 10 pounds pressure, I'm going to put an expansion tank in this system because as I heat the water or chill the water, if you're using a chilled water system, that water is going to expand and contract, and my pressure is going to change. So basically all this is is there's a rubber membrane, a diaphragm across this tank, and it's got air captive inside that. In fact, when you take these out of the box and you look at the, the connection at the end, you'll see a rubber diaphragm is pushed right against that connection there. So these tanks are typically in the box at 12 pounds pre-charge air pressure. Now, in this example, we'd have to lower that down to 10 pounds because our fill pressure is 10. We want that pre-charge to match 10 pounds of pressure. So what's going to happen now is this water heats up and expands, it's going to push into this tank and it won't cause the pressure to go up excessively in our loop so that we pop off our relief valve on our boiler. So it's just a spring in the system or think of it as a shock absorber maybe. So wherever you, the installer, the designer, the person that's doing the troubleshooting or working on this, wherever you make this physical connection into the system where this expansion tank ties into the system establishes that point of no pressure change. Because what we know to be true about water is we can't squeeze water, not under these kind of pressures anyways, and we can't stretch water. It's not like candy or like taffy where we can take a little piece of it and stretch it apart. So we can't change what goes on at this point right here by the pump that we're going to put in this circuit. So as this circulator starts up, if you had a gauge on the discharge side of the circulator, and you plug that in, immediately you'll see a pressure increase of about, what do we got, about 8, 9 pounds pressure increase. And now what will happen as the flow goes around this loop, it's going to use up, that's called head energy. We're taking the centrifugal force of this motor, spinning this around, causing that pressure increase. And as we go around this loop, that end head energy that we added, the 8 or 9 pounds of pressure differential, let's call it delta P pressure differential, is going to get used up. So this first gauge immediately jumped up to uh, 18 pounds at the discharge. This one's going to be reading at 17 pounds with the pump running. And as we go around the loop, we keep using up, using up that head energy. We get down to the last bend, and we come down here, and you can see that we didn't drop below that 10 pounds of pressure because I can't change the amount of water that's in the system here. Where would it come from? If I added more water into it, it'd have to come from somewhere. If I took water out of it, it I would have to put it out somewhere. So this point of no pressure change will stay at 10 pounds static pressure regardless of what this pump is doing. Now notice there's a little droop of pressure right here because unless this tank is exactly at the suction side of that circulator, even one inch of copper tube would have a little bit of pressure drop. So that's why you're seeing that little bit of a droop right there. But So what happens now is all the head energy that this circulator can add to the system shows up as a positive increase in pressure everywhere in the system. And that's because we're, point, we're pumping away from this point of no pressure change. So let me change just one thing in this drawing, and let's just move that expansion tank to the discharge side of the circulator. Now, the only way that circulator can cause fluid to move around through the system, it's got to create a pressure differential. It's got to change the pressure from the discharge side to the intake side, or the water wouldn't move around there. It would just stay uh, still in there. So in this case, since I moved this point of no pressure change to the discharge side, the pump says, well, i got to make a differential somewhere. I'm spinning. I'm running. i got water in here somewhere I got to create this pressure differential it's taken it from the suction side of the pump and not only did I take it from the suction side but in this, this example here even though I start out at five pounds I went a little bit lower pressure to, to show this example a little bit more um, a little bit more defined what can happen with the circulator so I started out with five pounds of pressure I got that same pump developing that nine pounds of pressure but it's making its pressure difference, it's differential from the suction side. So as I went around here, I started out with six pounds pressure, went down to four, went down to two, but notice that when I got back 
but I'm down at sub-atmospheric conditions here. I've pulled a negative condition inside there. Now that's going to be a problem for a number of reasons. Is number one, we can cause water to boil at a lower temperature. So if we put a vacuum or a negative uh, sub-atmospheric condition and it's happened to be running at you know 190, uh, 190 degrees or something like that, I can actually cause that to flash to steam here. I also really want to have a positive five point. Uh, five pounds of pressure at the highest point in my system. So if I've got any little like float vents or automatic air vents in my system, I want to make sure that they've got about five pounds of positive pressure so when that float floats up to shut the air off after the air comes out, shuts off so no uh, water comes out, if I've got a little bit positive pressure that's helping that float make that seal against that um, the top uh, stem on that air vent. So I want to see that positive pressure in my system and also if I'm going to put a boiler in downstream here with this, I want to make sure that that boiler sees that increase in pressure from the circulator. So if you go to a job from this day forward, that's the first thing I want you to look at or if you see a drawing that somebody's put together for you, I want you to look at this relationship between the pump and the expansion tank because all I have to do in this drawing here is just change this connection port. I don't have to physically move this tank if it happens to be you know, bolted to the wall or if it's a floor mount where it's screwed down to the wall. I know here in Reno they got to seismically restrain these so it, it's probably going to be fastened. I don't have to physically move it over here. I just need to move this connection point over to here and immediately when I do that and I plug my pump back in, you can see all my differential now shows up as a positive pressure throughout my system. So that's in a nutshell the, the point of pumping away from the point of no pressure change. Now it looks very simple in this drawing and it is fairly simple in this drawing and I'll show you an example here. But what happens when you get into more uh, complicated systems where you've got um, you know, multiple pumps, you've got a hydraulic separator, you've got a boiler on one side, where does the expansion tank go? We'll get to that in a minute. So here's the concept right here. So what Dan Holohan presented to the industry years ago, I said, well, why don't you just build this module for every job you do? You could even build this in the shop before you go out to the job and put everything in one package or one component, mount it on a piece of wood or just pipe it up so that you've always got your ex expansion tank connected to the suction side of your pump, you've always got your um, air elimination device on the hottest point in the system, and then you, you never have a problem. You've got this pump adding all its positive pressure to the distribution to the downstream side of it. You never have a problem with that. And what pumping away can do for the troubleshooters out there, if you've got a job that's got a chronic air problem and you go back there every year and every plumber in town has worked on the system and the homeowner says, you know, you come over here and you bleed all the air out of it and a month later I got air in my system, it's noisy, I can't sleep at night, you know, how come you can't get this solved? A lot of times it's just a matter of moving that expansion tank to this, you know, to the right side of the uh, pump, to the suction side of the pump. It shows up as an increase. And what the increase in pressure will do, it'll make any bubbles that are stuck in there, these tiny little micro bubbles that you can't seem to get out and keep out, you squeeze them smaller as you put more pressure on it. And so you can solve a chronic a rogue air problem sometimes by just making sure that you're pumping away from your expansion tank and that your system is seeing this increase in pressure. So after 30 or 40 years of Dan Holohan pounding this in our head, most people get it now that we want to pump away from wherever the expansion tank in the system. So. Then we start uh, looking at primary secondary piping. So here's an example of um, a system up here on the left, which is a primary secondary. And the reason that primary secondary became important in our industry is when these first modcon boilers started making their way across from Europe, these uh, little Giannomi, this little French made heat exchanger had a high pressure drop heat exchanger. It was a small diameter tube heat exchanger in there. And so what this boiler really needed was to have its own pump dedicated just to do this loop right here, just to make sure that this boiler got enough flow going through it that you didn't overheat the boiler, that you didn't go into a lockout condition. So we said, well, instead of putting the boiler right in the loop like the previous slide, let's pull the boiler out of the loop and we'll make what's called a primary loop here. So this is just a loop. Maybe it goes around the building. Maybe it's just in the mechanical room. So this pump here just moves the fluid around through this loop. And then this pump here just maintains the correct flow going through the boiler. Well, now that gets a little bit more complicated because now would my expansion tank go here? Should it go here? Where would I put an expansion tank in the system that they're both pumping away? Well, in this drawing, it's still fairly easy. Anywhere on the suction side here on this blue line, this pump is pumping away from the point of no pressure change through this piping right here, as is this one through here. So still pretty easy to do. And you'll see different manufacturers will suggest either primary, secondary, like this drawing right here, or some will give you the option to use um, 
hydraulic separator instead of the primary secondary, which brings some other additional features to it. So um, this assures by pumping away from this point of no pressure change that this boiler is going to see that increase that this pump adds to the system. Let's say it's going to add that same nine pounds of pressure. Now that's going to depend on the piping circuit that you're pumping through, but that boiler that started out at that 10 pounds fill pressure when this pump is running is now immediately going to see 18 pounds of pressure on it. And some of these boilers, a lot of these new boilers, actually have little pressure switches right up here on their uh, piping of the boiler, and that's in there to act as a low water cutoff device. So if this boiler, especially when it's elevated above the piping, as it is in this drawing, if this boiler ever um, was low on pressure because there was a leak in the system somewhere, that little differential pressure switch in there will shut off the burner so we don't dry fire the boiler. So by having this pump pumping into that boiler, that additional delta P, that pressure differential established by this pump when it's running, shows up as even more increase in pressure in that boiler above the static fill pressure. So the boiler people like that, they're happy about that, the boiler's happy about that, we've got the right amount of flow rate, we've got our hydraulic separation, this pump isn't going to ever uh, um, run and bump against this pump because they're separated by this closely spaced T mechanism or with the hydraulic separator over here. And you can see we've got a dirt separator here. So that is kind of the concept about uh, pumping away and pumping through the new high pressure drop type of boilers. So now, hey Bob, this, one, hey Bob this is Mark. Yeah, go uh, maybe go back to that prior slide because that good question just came in. All right, yeah, we'll do questions as they come along. That way I can do them when I'm, I'm on the slide, so we'll get to the end and we never remember which, which slide we are on when the question came in. So go ahead. Can you talk about your learnings about the orientation of an expansion tank? Here we see a vertically oriented expansion tank facing upward in all three cases. Yeah. And uh, there's pros and cons, uh, supposedly, with facing up or facing down as it relates to the debris and corrosion. So uh, the question is, can you explain um, your position? Yeah, and you know what? I just recently, in fact, it was at the ASHRAE show last year in January, I went by the Amtro booth and they gave me this little engineering handbook that I think the first one was developed in 1987 or something like that. They've updated over the years. And that's the first time I've actually seen somebody explain you know, the mounting positions of a, of a diaphragm or a, a bladder type expansion tank. You know, can it be mounted vertically like this? Can it go on its side? Can it go upside down? And according to the, you know, the extra tanks made by Amtrol, they said this can go in this position here with the stem facing straight up or it can lay on its side this way here. They don't encourage it to be with the nipple facing down. And again, you know, I would prefer whatever brand you're using if they have another reason that you could mount it a different way. I know some of these tanks, instead of just having a diaphragm in here, this one, let's assume is a, uh, let's say an Amtrol, just to use a name that you're probably all familiar with. The way this tank is built is there's a rubber membrane, an EPDM or butyl rubber membrane, and it's actually crimped in the center of this tank. So there's air on the bottom side of it. And then there's the fluid from the system pushes down on this thing. And as the pressure goes up, it pushes down. So this is always moving up and down in here. So one of the reasons that we don't want to put this the other way is this um, <clears throat> part of the tank has water and it. it's just a steel vessel. So what we don't want to do is we don't want any dirt or any uh, debris that's coming out of the system to go down against that membrane. So as this membrane moves up and down that the debris and the deposits go in there and they can lay on the side of it. So if the tank is in this position or if it's laying on the side, that seems to be acceptable by the people that manufacture the tank. So. Um, what I was going to say about these tanks, now some of them that you can mount the other way, some of these are have what they call a bag type of expansion tank where they actually put like a big balloon inside here. So the fluid actually goes inside the balloon instead of inside the steel vessel. And as far as I understand, that that one's not so critical to mount it upside down because you don't have water in the steel vessel. The system fluid is actually inside the bladder, the bag that's inside there instead of having that diaphragm. So that type of tank, you know, might be acceptable if you wanted to mount that, you know, I don't know why you would do that, but with the nipple, you know, facing down with that tank maybe in this orientation. So I guess to answer the question, it depends on the type of tank and what the manufacturers um, are comfortable with because they're, they're going to be the ones that have to warn that tank if there's a, a failure on it. So hopefully that, that clears that up a little bit. I think the point there, Bob, is that in that left, diagram, the expansion tank is not in the flow path of the circulation going through the system and thus not subject to debris getting caught into that diaphragm and causing yeah. wear, right? Exactly. And, and that, 
Um, let me see if I've got one. I might have one coming up a little bit later. In this example here, now this here is just an air separator. Now sometimes and we sell combination air and dirt separators that could be used in this position right here. And the, the caution we have there, if this were a dirt separator where it's causing the dirt that would come through here to fall out, then if you mount it straight below the you know, a combination air and dirt separate, then you could have dirt debris falling down against that tank there. So in that case, we'd say, well, just put another T here and bring the tank off the T so it's not straight down from it. In this drawing, in all these drawings, we're just showing these as air separators, and there really shouldn't be a lot of dirt and debris. We're going to catch the dirt and debris down here, so it really doesn't have the potential to get into this had um, this tank mounted, you know, if we had a T cut in the system right here, um, we're hopefully catching all our dirt and debris and magnetic particles here before they, you know, get around this loop to where they could get down into that um, tank. It's just when you hang it straight below a combination air and dirt separator, you've got the potential for that um, that dirt to settle down on that diaphragm, and then as it moves, it can rub and wear on that uh, on that diaphragm. Now in this case here, so I put a little different spin on this. So you said, well, you just told me to put my pumps and my expansion tank right there. But if you're using this type of boiler, like a cast iron sectional boiler, there's very little pressure drop, almost no pressure drop in those vessels. So you could, in fact, put the expansion tank down here. And this whole section from right here where this connection is being made, if I can get my cursor to co uh, cooperate, uh, through this vessel, because this is a wide open vessel, this whole piping becomes the point of no pressure change. So every one of these pumps is still seeing this is the point of no pressure change, even though it's not exactly, you know, within inches of where the pump's being located. Now, that will only work if you've got a boiler that has very low pressure drop, like a sectional cast iron boiler, or maybe, uh, you know, a steel type of boiler that's just a big wide open vessel. I wouldn't be able to do this with a boiler that has a high pressure drop because then I don't have my point of no pressure change going through this low pressure drop vessel to establish that point up here. So, you know, this would work. So now you're saying, well, okay, I'll put the expansion tank here. It's out of harm's way as far as any dirt and debris get into it. And by the way, that's a good spot. This to move. A good spot to put my uh, fill valve because the point of no pressure change is where I want to be able to reference my fill pressure going to the system. So this does make a nice little, and we actually make a kit for doing this where we've got the expansion tank, the fill valve, we give you a nice brass tee and a brass nipple to build this little module just as you see it in the picture here, and you can put it in that position there. I'm still pumping away. I've got my air separator where it needs to be. I've got my fill valve where it needs to be. This will work, but only if you've got a low pressure drop type of a boiler that you're putting. And now I say boiler, you know, this could be a chiller. If we're using a chilled water system, um, we still want to do air removal and stuff like that. Now, what I will say if this was a chiller, that we would move the air separation down here because on a chiller, the water coming back to the chiller is going to be a little bit warmer than the water going out, so that would uh, move that... Um, air purger down to that point, but we'd still have the, uh, the point of no pressure change established by that expansion tank in this picture at the bottom. All right, probably the second most common, sometimes the first most common mistake I see is the use of thermostatic mixing valves to mix down temperature for radiant systems. So you've got a you know high temperature system, maybe you've got some panel radiators or some baseboard, and you want to put in a small radiant loop or you want to add a uh, a mixed down temperature for some reason for a, a lower distribution. So <clears throat> what you want to be aware of and what you want to be careful with these thermostatic, thermostatic mixing valves is the flow rate through that valve. And what I see a lot of times is guys are just using, and you can do that, you know, we sell a little valve that can be used for mixing like this, but these were originally designed to be thermostatic mixing valves for domestic water. And when this valve is used in a domestic water application, I probably got 40, 50, 60, maybe even 80 pounds of pressure that's driving through this valve, so even if I take a little bit of pressure drop going through that valve, let's say a three gallon a minute flow rate, it's not really going to affect the flow out through my faucet or something like that. But in this picture here, I've got, let's go back to that original drawing and say this pump can only develop about six, eight pounds of pressure differential. I got to make sure that this valve isn't putting too much pressure drop, too much pressure restriction on that, that I'm not going to get the flow going through here. So what you'll find is most of these little thermostatic mixing valves that are out there are going to be about a 3, 3.1 CV, which means if you had three gallons a minute going through that valve, you're going to have a one pressure drop. Now that's acceptable. So let's say this drawing right here, I've got how many circuits do I have here? Seven circuits at one gallon per minute there. I need to have seven gallons a minute going through that circuit, and now I put a valve in there that's got a 3 CV 
How many, how many do I have? Let me count this. One, two, three, four. I got 12 there. That's why I made this example here. So I got I need 12 gallons per minute. I've got a valve with a 3 CV rating on it. And so if I go to this little chart, which we uh, we put together this little quick sheet for calculating CV here. So on this one right here, I want to find a pressure drop through that valve if I'm trying to move 10 gallons a minute through a valve that's got a CV rating of 3. So I put 3 in there, put the flow rate I want to put in there, and there's my pressure drop going through that valve. That's a pretty high pressure drop. This is going to have to be a pretty sizable pump to overcome the pressure drop through that valve when you're trying to get 10 gallons a minute through that valve for all these one gallon per minute um, uh, circuits here on them. Let's call that a radiant zone, a radiant manifold with uh, loops going out to it. So what you want to do if you do need that kind of flow rate, we do make high flow mixing valves specifically for doing radiant applications where it's got a much higher, it's a bigger valve, it's got a higher flow rate that we don't get in this condition here because what the call will be on the system is they'll say, you know, my heat works fine until we get down close to design days. Let's, let's say you design for zero degrees outside. And they said, you know, when it gets down to about 10 degrees outside or lower than that, my heat's not keeping up anymore. I got my thermostat set at 70, the temperature's dropping to 68, down to 65, down to 62. What's going on? The boiler's running, the boiler's shutting off. I got plenty of horsepower in the boiler. What's going on? Well, you've constipated your distribution by putting a low CV valve as a mixing device in here and you don't have enough pump to overcome that pressure drop. Now, what you could do, obviously, is go back and speed up the pump or put a larger pump in, but you really want to pay attention to the sizing of this. You know, in a perfect world, we would size the CV of this valve for this here. We would buy a, you know, a 12 CV valve. Now, you won't find the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12 CV valve. So you got to interpolate and you got to use this chart down there and say, okay, what kind of pressure drop can I accept going through my system here with the pump that I want to use and get enough flow through it? So just Look at this when you go to jobs and you see a thermostatic mixing valve has been installed on a system. Pay attention to how many gallon per minute, you know, just count how many ports are on the manifold or sometimes you can tell just by looking at the pipe size how many gallons per minute they're trying to get out to that system and make sure that this isn't the bottleneck that somebody's put into that system where they've, you know, put a valve that's got too restrictive of a flow path to be able to allow that 10 gallon a minute going through that system, which, again, you only need that 10 gallon a minute on design day. We got a mild day and only three of these are opened up. This is going to be just fine with that three gallon a minute flow going through it. It's when every one of these is calling for heat on a design day, that's when you're going to start to notice this. And one other thing I want to caution you about, people say, well, I'll just get a bigger, you know, I'll get a one-inch thermostatic mixing valve and I'll get a lot more flow. i got a one-inch pipe instead of three-quarter, that'll solve it. Well, just pay attention because a lot of times the size of the pipe to the valve doesn't change the CV rating of that valve. So our little 521 valve, it's going to be a 3 CV whether you buy it in a three-quarter inch or one-inch pipe size. The pipe size doesn't change the size of the valve in there unless you go to a high-flow mixing valve. And we have high-flow thermostatics and then we also have... Um, motorized valves that you can do that too. So this this happens a lot and again it only happens at design conditions where this bottleneck starts to uh, uh, get you a call on the phone where they're not getting enough heat. Uh, let's see if I covered all that. And we do make this available. If you This chart can be used a bunch of different ways. You can use it for troubleshooting, you can use it for design. So as long as you know any two numbers, you put those into the yellow boxes and you can solve for the other one. So if you know the CV of the valve, and you know how many gallons per minute is required by that manifold there, you put that in there and that's going to give you the pressure drop. Now if I knew the other two numbers and I want to find, well, how many gallons per minute am I going to get through there, and I knew the CV of my valve was, um, it was a 3 CV valve, and I had a pressure gauge on here that I could me measure the pressure drop across that circuit and put that in there, I get back to that same, I could tell how many gallons per minute is going to go out to that system by just using the math the opposite direction. So. You can use that uh, for both design work or for troubleshooting if you're trying to figure out why a system isn't, isn't working properly. So let's look at a couple different primary, secondary. And this, again, was, I think, Bell and Gossett probably established this concept back in the 1960s. It was originally designed for larger buildings where you wanted to run just one big loop through the entire building, and everywhere that you wanted to put a heat emitter, you would just put a a pair of closely spaced T's, so this pump just moved the conveyor belt, so to speak, moved the energy throughout the building, and then every one of these pumps would be sized just for the load that it needed. If this one needed five gallons a minute and three and ten gallons a minute, you would size these pumps and they would never interfere with um, the flow through the primary loop. Well, occasionally guys get a little bit balled up on that concept, and what they've done here is they've morphed this from a primary loop 
primary secondary loop here by not connecting it with closely spaced T's and saying, well, I'm used to bringing my return back down to this side here and my supply here. So you've got kind of a high red primary secondary parallel loop system here. So <clears throat> what's going to happen in this case here is in we, these pumps, since they're not hydraulically separated, you can actually cause flow to go out through these circuits when this pump is running if the pressure drop in this circuit is higher than the pressure drop in the loops going out there. So these primary secondary, you get, if you don't have closely spaced T's, you don't have primary secondary. Just remember it that way. There's no other way to, pri uh, to pipe a primary secondary loop without having two T's closely spaced together here. This is, you can't balance this out. There's nothing that you can do to cheat this out to make it work right. <clears throat> and it's just, uh, again, it's just the concept of having that little separation in that point here. And I think I got a Another example that coming up. So here's another example of primary secondary. So instead of putting now, it's got all the T's up here. You've got plenty of T's here, but look at what's going on here. So I've got a primary pump moving through this loop. I've got let's say a 10 gallons a minute through that, and then I look at what's uh, um, the flow going out to all my circuits here. So these different circuits, the different loads going out to them. So you can see what's going to happen here. So if I've got uh, let's say a 15 gallon a minute flow, going, let's see, I got to get rid of my little control box in the way here. Let me move that. So if I've got a 15 gallon a minute flow going through my primary loop, I've got a 15 gallon a minute pump through here, moving 15 gallons a minute through there, and now I've got one pump taking 10 gallons a minute out. I've got this pump taking uh, four gallons a minute out. So I've got 15 gallons a minute going out here, one gallon a minute's going straight through the loop, and then once the flow comes back in here, I'm back to 15 gallons a minute. So what you remember is what goes out of a T must come into a T, what comes into a T must go out of a T. So what's going out of the T here, this 10 gallons a minute, it's going to go through my distribution and it's going to come back into the system here as 10 gallons a minute. That flow rate doesn't change going through the loop. What changes is the flow rate going through this, this common section right here. Now as these pumps go in and out and these flow rates change, the amount of flow going through this section right here is going to change. So what we need to do is we need to have our primary secondary connections that our supply and return need to be right back against one another. So this 10 gallons a minute that's going out here is coming back here. So I still have that 10 gallons a minute uh, flow coming out of the T, going back into the T. I go on to my next one, I take whatever it needs out. So in this drawing right here, you can see I've got 15 gallons a minute coming out, 14 going through the system, one going straight through the uh, common section of the primary secondary, and I get back to 15 gallons a minute. My control panel all the way again. So now in this drawing down here, let's take that same thing. And now I've got an 8 gallon a minute flow in my primary loop. Let's say I've got a variable speed on my boiler and it's modulating up and down based on the load. So now look what happens. I've got 10 gallons a minute on this one, 4 gallons a minute. I've got 14 gallons a minute going out. But since I don't have my closely spaced T's, I've actually got reverse flow in this common section of my piping. So it's got, what, again, what goes out of a T has to come into a T. So if I need 14 gallons a minute out to my system and I've only got 8 gallons a minute going around through my loop, it's going to take 8 gallons a minute from this side and it's going to take eight, uh, 6 gallons a minute from this side to equal my 14. So I've got flow reversal going in here. And that's where this thing gets wrong when you don't pipe these with these closely spaced T's. Supply, return, supply, return, supply, return. You can't put all your supplies and all your return. So, you know, it, it looks on paper like this should work, but this is what's going to happen in here. You're not going to get your, um, your temperature of that system because you got this flow reversal going on here, pulling the six gallons per minute backwards through that common piping. So it's got to have closely spaced T's and they got to be right next to one another. Now here's another example of a, a mistake that's made sometimes. So here's my primary loop and back here somewhere I've got my boiler, I've got my expansion tank, but now I'm pumping into my system instead of pumping away from it. So now this, instead of pumping away from the point of no pressure change, which has been established by the expansion tank in this loop uh, back here somewhere, now I'm pumping into it. I want this pump to always pump on the hot side, pumping away from my first T here, pumping out to my system, going through my distribution, and coming back into it. So the secondary circulator needs to pump away just like when we pump away from the expansion tank in a single uh, series parallel loop system, we need to pump away. So if you see this on a job, again, this is going to be a hacksaw right here on this one. This is going to be a little bit more than just flopping the pump to go the opposite direction because I do need to pump out of the hot side out to the system. I do need to return on the right side T here on the return side. So I'm going to have to physically move this pump over this piping here and, uh, you know, put a space or something in there where I take that pump out.
And let me just tell you a couple more common uh, uh, primary secondary uh, glitches that we see. So here's an example. If somebody says, you know what? Between every closely spaced T's, if I put a ball valve in there, what I can do is I can, let's say I've got six of these primary secondary connections onto this loop, I can shut this valve off and I can purge every every one of these loops through one ball valve somewhere down on my primary loop so I don't have to put, you know, a, call it whatever you want, a webstone type of valve like I showed you here on every loop. I'll just use one of these, save some money on all my purge valves, and just use, um, you know, just isolate one of these, do this one, open it up, shut the one off here, do that one, go on to the next and the next. But even having a full port ball valve in there, you're going to establish a little bit of pressure drop between those two T's. Even if you close nipple this together and let's say the you know, overall length that ends up being, you know, 8, 10, 12 inches. I've established some pressure drop in there, and I could, under certain conditions, when this primary pump is running, I can actually establish a little bit of ghost flow going out through this loop. Just by adding that little bit of pressure drop between those two T's is going to encourage some flow out through this loop, and I could have a zone that overheats, even though this pump isn't calling for heat, that zone is never running, just because I've... Uh, I put enough pressure drop between those two T's that I've encouraged some flow going out to that system. So I know it's tempting to do that, to put a valve in between there for uh, for purging or maybe for service work, but it is going to, it can cause some problems. Um, the other one we see, so what can happen on these here is you really need to have check protection on both sides of these. Anytime you go vertically off a, a horizontal pipe like this where you have hot water going through it, you've got the potential to set up a thermal siphon through this loop because what happens is hot water wants to rise, cold water wants to fall, that's just a, a mother nature at work there. So what we need to do is you see in this picture here we've got a check valve and that's going to prevent flow from going through this circuit when this pump is shut off. In some cases, you need to go back and put a secondary check valve on the return. So when this pump is off, this check is protecting flow from going through this way, and this check on this side will protect any flow from going two directions, believe it or not. Hot water can rise up through the center of this pipe, cold water comes down the outside, and you can get a little bit of ghost flow called back-end circulation by not having check protection on both sides. But this here is, is also shown where this, I think, is a much better way to do this. Just put a purge mechanism on every one of these secondary loops when you take it off your primary loop. It does add one more component to every loop, but it is a better way to assure that you don't get that little bit of pressure drop in between here that can cause some flow when you don't need or want it. Now, one of the other concepts that came out years ago I said, well, instead of check valves, why don't we just make a thermal drop? And think of this as a P-trap under your kitchen sink, where if you put enough drop, enough um, dimension to this drop right here, what you'll get is you'll get the buoyancy of that water, this hot water can overcome this drop, this thermal drop going down through here, and it'll stop the ghost flow. And what happens in this drawing here, the guy said, well, I'll put one of those on the both sides so that I, instead of using a check valve on my pump and a check valve up here, I use two thermal drops. All I need is a little bit of additional pipe, no more valves in there. Well, when they do that, these two offset one another, and you're right back to what you had before, is you've got the potential without check protection in here to get thermal siphoning through that loop. So the thermal drops, you know, on paper, again, they sounded, they look good, they're going to save you a little bit of money, but again, misapplied, like in this drawing here, you're going to get right back to the same problem that you had without the check protection in there to begin with. So the thermal drops, again, uh, a little dicey. You're better off just using good, solid check protection. What what we're finding now is most of the circulators that you buy come with these check valves either in the box with the pump or sometimes they're installed in the pump. So there's no reason for this to happen anymore if they're supplying these check valves um, with the small wet rotor circulators that you see. All right, boiler return protection. If you're using a boiler that isn't designed to work at condensing uh, conditions like a modcon boiler, modulated condensing boiler, you need to protect that boiler to make sure that if you've got a big load out here, if you've got a, uh, you know, let's say a large mass radiant system or you've got even cast iron boilers in a job, what can happen is when this boiler starts up, that cold water is going to come back and it's going to keep this boiler sweating or condensing and eventually you can rot the heat exchange, you can rot the flue pipe. So we need a way to make sure that this boiler always sees water you know, above the dew point of the fuel. Typically, we're going to say about 130 degree return temperature. So one of the piping, and unfortunately, you see this in some of the boiler installation manuals, they say, well, just put a pump 
between the supply and return, and that pump is just going to move some flow out of the boiler back down the return, and it's going to make sure that that boiler always has um, some of the warm water going back to it to raise this temperature to make sure that you've got return temperature protection. Well, not really. That doesn't happen because unless this pump can respond to a temperature condition here, like it says, okay, this is down to 120 degrees, I'm going to have to slow down or I'm going to have to shut off for a little bit until it catches up. It doesn't give you absolute 100% return protection. You might get lucky and some days it'll work. It really depends on how much thermal mass you have out here working against you. You know, if this is just a couple little cast iron radiators, you know, you might get away with that. I've also seen this done with a ball valve, where they'll put a ball valve in here instead of a pump, and when this is running, they'll just kind of choke down that ball valve, so a little bit of flow is always going back to the boiler, and the rest of it's going out to the system. But again, it's a guesstimate. You don't know for sure unless you can measure and respond to and correctly get this temperature here. So another drawing that I'm starting to see out there is they're saying, well, we've got these variable speed circulators now, we'll just put a variable speed circulator in there and that'll just rev up and slow down to make sure that this temperature here, they'll put the sensor there and say, okay, this uh, pump here is going to look at that temperature and it's going to slow down and speed up to make sure that I've always got that 130 degree return in the boiler. Well, again, that's not absolutely positive going to happen every time because if you've got a large thermal mass system out here, let's say you've got a, oh, a big trucking facility that's got, you know, 50,000 square feet of concrete slab that's sitting out there at 65 degrees, that slab is going to be able to overpower what this pump can do. There's no way this pump is going to be able to keep up with that kind of load out here to assure this boiler gets that adequate temperature going back to it. Now, <clears throat> you can sometimes, uh, you know, put this in where this pump can just shut off at that condition. This pump will shut off until this pump keeps up to it. But this, this can work. There's a good application for a variable speed delta T type of circulator to protect this boiler. But you got to put one more step in here to make sure that you've got absolute protection. And it looks like this one <clears throat> right here. In fact, it's even simpler as far as the piping goes. So now what I've done is I've got this here circulator run on the variable speed and it's watching the temperature here. So it's going to shut off its heat delivery or slow down its heat delivery to the distribution system if it's allowing this temperature to return back to the boiler below my condensing condition. So this very simple piping with a variable speed delta T circular, let's call it, you can buy these off the shelf now or you can buy controls that would make a, a typical you know, off the shelf circulator run under this type of a uh, delta T condition. This is going to give you 100% boiler protection because I am watching the temperature and I am responding to that at this point here. So this works. The previous two don't always work. They're not going to sure. This one certainly isn't. This one mine some of the time, but it just really depends on what's going on out here. And unless you know that, you're not going to get your protection. So just um, Keep this drawing if you're doing this type of thing. And where this is going to be important, if you're using oil-fired boilers, if you're using this as a, you know, a, a conventional boiler, it might be a pellet-fired boiler, it might be a wood-fired boiler, those boilers are sensitive to return temperature conditions because they need to be above that, um, that dew point of that fuel or you're going, to have, uh, you're going to have a boiler corroding away. All right, what do I got left here? <clears throat> All right, this is another uh, problem that we've seen with guys misapplying these thermostatic mixing valves in their piping. So what they've done here is they put a, and kind of a morph between the primary and uh, secondary system here, but they're using a single um, pump here, which if this is a cast iron boiler, you could probably get away with a single pump, but what you can see they're doing here is they don't have the right flow path through this thermostatic mixing valve. So what will happen here is it's going to take the path of least resistance when this pump is running and it's just going to come through this valve and it's going to go right back through the system and down to that and you're not going to get any flow going out to this distribution system here. This really needs to be tied into a primary secondary loop with the closely spaced T's so that you've got the flow going through here, going through the boiler, you're getting your heat out to this loop, and that this mixing valve via another pump right here can get the flow rate going out through there. It pulls the temperature through this thermostatic mixing valve by pulling some of the hot, pulling some of the cold, got the pump size for the pressure drop through the, um, the system and the pressure drop through the, let's call it a 3 CV valve again. Now we've got the, the pump size properly to our pressure drop of both our valve and our distribution system. So, um, again, I think somebody was just trying to get away with just using the single pump instead of doing primary, secondary, and they had an additional pumps out on the, on the mixing valve side of that. And it's not, you can't 
pipe this like you're doing a domestic water, you know, uh, a hot water tank where you've got the pressure of the system driving through that mixing valve, you're dependent on all the delta P of this pump to go through this circuit as well as through the um, the mixing valve as well as all the loops here. So uh, it it takes a pump, a static mixing valve, to make that work. Now here's a, a really nice way to solve a lot of the different problems that we've talked about. This one simple device in the center here called a hydraulic separator, it's going to fix all these problems that we've been talking about. It's going to make sure that this pump always gets the right amount of flow going out to this circuit here. It's going to make sure this thermostatic mixing valve always gets enough flow going through it the way it's tied in the system. And by the way, it's going to give you air elimination, it's going to give you dirt elimination down here, it's going to give you magnetic separation, and now all you have to do is buy a basic thermostatic mixing valve to give my boiler return protection. So now I don't have to have a pump in there to do my uh, return protection, I don't have to have a mixing uh, a ball valve and something like that. I've got 100% return protection with my thermostatic mixing valve, I've got 100% of the flow I need through that boiler because I've got a dedicated pump to that circuit there, I've got my air, I've got my dirt. And over here, I've got my separation, so if one pump is running, if two of these zones are open, if all those zones are open at one time, I'm going to get the exact amount of flow I need to that system because the hydraulic separator is keeping this A side, the boiler side, separated from the distribution side by putting a wide spot in the road. Really, that's all that a hydraulic separator is doing is making a big wide passageway here so that I've got a flow path going through here, not affecting what's going on here. If this... Uh, distribution happens to be running, the boiler pump isn't running, these pumps are just going to pull the flow right through that mixing, um, right through the hydraulic separator and uh, sure that I've got the right amount of flow rate going out. What you'll see happening now, and we offer this as a module, <clears throat> is this could be a variable speed delta P pump and that's a differential pressure pump and as these zones open and close this pump is always changing the speed so if one zone's open and I need let's say one gallon a minute that pump's going to automatically modulate down and give me one gallon a minute if all these zones are open and I need whatever we got there six gallons per minute that pump will modulate up and give me the flow I need again make sure that size for that flow rate but as these flow rates on both these pumps are ever changing the only way that's going to work is you you have to have hydraulic separation for that to be able to run at those different flow conditions and not affect what's going on inside that boiler. So this couldn't be just, you know, this pumping right out of the boiler is a series loop. This is the key component in here, and like I say, it just brings a lot of additional, uh, I'm looking for time, a lot of additional features. The last couple slides I want to talk about here. A couple things you want to know when you start using primary, secondary, or hydraulic separators is when there's flow coming into this device and flow going out of this device, the flow rates on both sides of this could be ever-changing. If I'm using a pump with a variable speed boiler in it, which a lot of them are starting to do now, and I've got variable speed pumping over here, I've got different conditions going through and going on inside this hydraulic separator. So I can have one of three conditions going on inside a hydraulic separator or closely spaced T's. If the flow rate from the boiler is, let's say, 10 gallons a minute, and I've got, let's say, a single zone of radiant, just one big snow melt zone, let's call it, at 10 gallons a minute, what's going to happen is 10 gallons a minute is going to come in for my thing working through my uh, hydraulic separator, and 10 gallons a minute is going to go out. 10 gallons a minute, what goes into a T must come out of a T. 10 gallons a minute is coming back here. 10 gallons a minute going straight through. Nothing, there's no blending, there's no mixing, nothing's going on inside this hydro separator. It really now becomes a, a, a air elimination device, a dirt elimination device, possibly magnetic separation. I don't really have any separation going on in there until I start changing the flow rates going on that's going through that device. So here's an example. Let's say I've got a, a higher flow rate from my boiler than I do from my distribution. And you can tell by the size of the arrows. You could put numbers to this if you know what your flow rate uh, the boiler manufacturer requires to go through there. But see what's happening down here is I'm starting to blend the temperature going back to my boiler. And you want to be aware of this, especially if you're using condensing boilers, because what I really want to do with a condensing boiler is I want to take the coldest possible water back to my boiler to keep that efficiency of that boiler up. So what I could do with this, knowing that these flow rates are going to change, what I'd like to do is be able to change this flow rate with a variable speed pump on the boiler, for example, so I could keep this flow rate, maybe widen the delta T on that boiler and keep this flow rate down, or keep this flow temperature, I guess I should be saying, this blue line going back to the boiler at the lowest possible temperature to keep the efficiency of that boiler at the highest point. <clears throat> 
or the opposite way. So in this case, I've got a lower flow rate going through my boiler. Let's say my boiler is modulating down to low fire. I've got a pump on there that's modulating down with it. And now I've got the uh, a higher flow rate going out here again by the bigger arrows. Now I've got a blending of the temperature going on here. So let's say this distribution out here needed 150 degrees. My boiler is running at 150 degrees. You're not going to get 150 degrees if this flow rate on this side is higher than this flow rate because now I've got a mixing point. I've got a blending point going on here. So you can run the numbers on this. All you need to do is plug in the flow rate going out to the system, which is going to be the same as the flow rate coming into it, but the temperature. So if I know the temperature going in, temperature coming out, same thing on this side, and I plug those numbers into there, I can predict exactly what this mixed temperature is going to be. And I want to make sure that if I get to a design condition on this system, if I need 100, again, say 150 degree water going out to here, and I'm blending 170 with you know return coming back to it, I might not be at the condition I need under the design condition. So just pay attention to this mixing that goes on in here. This is an excellent device, but you got to know, you got to understand what happens when you start varying the flow rates through this device. And so what we're finding now with variable speed circulators going on out here, so this is constantly changing, but now some of the boiler manufacturers are giving us either the the pump with the boiler that can vary the flow rate going through here to keep this temperature as low as possible by widening the delta T getting the lowest possible temperature back. So now these numbers are moving all over the place. We just need to know at our design condition that we're going to get the amount of uh, flu flow, fluid energy going out to our system and the right amount of flu going back to the, uh, fluid going back to the boiler so we don't have a, a lockout condition. That's it. I got it. Thanks, everybody, and we'll see uh, Mark will see you next month.